Okay, good morning everybody to BC 308, our um, class here on Daniel, Revelation and Daniel. We have been uh, going through the book of Daniel and we paused in chapter seven. We are going to pick up from there. Let's take a moment to pray. Good morning, Asha, Siddhant, Kung Bilu, and everybody else in the class. Uh, let's take a moment to pray, please, and then we will start. Could somebody lead us in prayer? Can we pray? Yes, Charles. Uh, dear Heavenly and Revealing God, we thank you so much that you love us so much to deliver that you allow us to understand your will, to understand even in the coming times that you revealed long time ago, but they are still being revealed even to us. Therefore, Lord, as we prepare to learn, that you will give us a spirit of learning and that we will be able to learn. And even Father, we pray that even our teacher will be able to have the right vocabulary to talk to us and that you will give him the your unction that he will be able to be led by you in doing this that your church will be edified and your name will be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so we have been journeying through Daniel. Uh, we read through Daniel chapter 7, and uh, we are going to look at it. Uh, in greater detail today, and then we progress chapter by chapter. Just a quick review. Uh, we started in chapter 2, uh, where we had uh, Daniel interpret the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, which was that of an image, head of gold, chest of silver, uh, uh, waist of bronze, uh, or I could say brass, legs of thighs, waist and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet, iron mixed with clay. So that was the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw. He also saw a big rock that wasn't cut by human hands that came out of heaven and crushed this whole image. And um, so we said that serves as an outline for a lot of things that are going to unfold in the uh, coming chapters in the book of Daniel. And um, we explained that e uh, Daniel points out saying, each of these parts of that image actually represent empires or kingdoms to come, starting with the Babylonian kingdom. Yeah, went through that. Then we looked at a portion in chapter 5 where Daniel foretold. Uh, the, the, the end of the Babylonian Empire, and this was with Belshazzar, who was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. He says, it's the end, your kingdom is going to be handed over to the Medes and the Persians. And sure enough, that night, Belshazzar was killed. The Medes came in, took over, Darius was appointed. So we saw that. And then we read through Daniel chapter 7. So Daniel 7 was actually a vision that Daniel had much earlier. He had written it down. But in the book of Daniel, it's given to us starting from chapter 7 on, because chapter 7 on is the prophetic section of that book. So um, in, in, in writing this um, um, vision down, um, Daniel, this is into the chapter now. I hope uh, you will have your Bibles open in front of you because um, I will just reference uh, the verse number and you can look at it with me uh, in your Bible. So in verse 2, Daniel begins by seeing these winds of heaven that are stirring the great sea. So here again, we said, you know, we have to use, uh, uh, so God is showing, giving this vision to Daniel using images. So there is wind, there is sea. 
equals two. So we have to always interpret images or biblical typology, you can call it that, because God is using a type or he's using a, a picture. Uh, so we have to interpret these pictures within the context of the scriptures itself. That's that's the way to do it. That we don't want to you know, make up something on our own. No, we stay within the Bible. So we cross-referenced uh, um, um, Mark chapter 13, 26, 27, where Jesus himself talks about the four winds of heaven. Basically, it's the it's a working of God, and it's uh, it's it's a movement. I mean, meaning things that are happening. Now, how God causes it will, uh, in you know, it could be varied. In in this particular case, God is causing things to happen on the earth. In Mark 13, it is God sending His angels to gather people from everywhere. So. You know, so how God is causing those things can vary depending on the context, but really the four winds is rep representing uh, action, movement um, uh, that is being caused. And here it's being caused on the great sea. So then we cross-referenced Revelation 17, 15, where we saw that the, gr the, the waters, the great sea, represent multitudes of people, nations, tongues, tribes, nations. Worldwide, so basically, Daniel seven two is telling us God is saying, "Look, I'm going to cause things to happen on the earth, right, or among the nations, and then it's going to unfold like this. How is it going to unfold?" Uh, Daniel verse three sees four great beasts. So this is the difficult part in Daniel seven, and also in Daniel eight we will see that. He's seeing very strange image, uh, images. He sees a lion. He sees, that is in verse 4. Um, he sees a bear, verse 5. Verse 6, he sees a leopard. And verse 7 is even more confusing because he sees, he just calls it a beast. There is no clear description. It's just a beast. Uh, that looks very dreadful. Now, I will just uh, share the PDF, uh, which uh, we have given in the coursework. Um, and it's very interesting uh, to compare what he saw in or what was given to us in Daniel chapter 2 with Daniel chapter 7. Right? So, and we can easily put these two together these two together right so he saw four great beasts coming out from i'm in daniel chapter 7 verse 3 four great beasts coming from the sea that means this is from among the nations right the first was four the first was like a lion that had eagle's wings and it was lifted up from the earth made to stand on two feet like a man a man's heart was given to it so this in some way captures what happened to the Babylonian Empire, but more specifically what happened in Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. He was lifted up from the earth. And when you read the earlier chapters of Daniel, historical information, you know, there was a time when Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind and behaved like a, almost like an animal. Uh, but then, you know, he was raised up. I mean, he came out of that. So he must have gone through some sort of a yeah, mental issue, whatever that was. Uh, he lost his mind, and then he was restored uh, to be a man. And so that points to the Babylonian Empire. And we will also see right, uh, later on. So now if you jump to Daniel chapter 7, verse 17. Let me pause here. I think somebody raised their hand. Yes, say you have a question. Sorry about that. That was a mistake. I got that. Okay, no problem. So, so if you look in Daniel seven verse seventeen, Daniel explains. Right, uh, actually, the uh, the Daniel is asking the angel, 
what 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 does all this mean the angel begins to explain verse 17 daniel 7 17 those great beasts which are for are for kings or for kingdoms which arise out of the earth so now the explanation is given in the scriptures itself so he's saying daniel you saw these beasts what do these beasts represent they represent four kingdoms well then immediately we go back to what happened in chapter 2 hey there also he was talking about kingdoms here again he's talking about kingdoms there he spoke about four kingdoms here he's also talking about four kingdoms so obviously there is a parallel uh, to both of these right so that's an interesting thing so so we line line these up side by side and we will understand a little bit more about these empires um, and then he says here um, the uh, the bear then going back to verse 5 Daniel 7 verse 5 uh, there was a beast like a bear uh, which had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth and uh, it said arise and devour now uh, don't worry too much about the details like the lion with wings so what do the wings mean don't worry too much about those things it's just part of the image unless the wings have something significant to do right so the lion with wings is just representing a, 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 a beast the key that we understand is it's representing a kingdom but don't worry about you know a the lion has a tail and the lion has wings and the lion has four legs oh, trying to break all of those things down if you start doing that it be unnecessarily getting to you know get off into uh, we get off into unnecessary things so that's very important unless the scriptures itself start telling us something oh the wings represent something then we have to get into it the scriptures don't say anything about it or don't tell us to do anything with it then leave it as it is right same thing here when you see about this bear and that's in verse 5 uh, uh, and it says here it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth uh, don't worry too much about you know the three ribs and why a bear okay God is just using images here and using the image of a bear to represent the Medo-Persia later on there will be some more details coming in a chapter 8 that's when you will see an example where fine details become important for instance in chapter 8 he talks about two horns one long bigger and one smaller there he begins to tell us specifically he starts speaking to us about the horns then that's when you pay attention to the minute details otherwise don't worry too much about it okay the same thing in verse 6 he says you know there's a leopard it has four wings like a bird and it has four heads now in verse 6 he's talking about a leopard and he's talking about four heads in this chapter he doesn't tell us to do anything with four heads so leave it aside but when you come into chapter 8 there these four heads become significant because then he starts telling us why four heads that's when he's specifically telling these four heads represent something okay then you pay attention to it but as of now in chapter 7 he doesn't he just says there's a leopard uh, a beast he sees a leopard four wings and four heads okay leave it as it is but the moment he starts focusing on certain details which will happen in chapter 8 then we also pay do that we pay attention to those details okay but for now leave it as it is leopard represents a beast okay that represents the you know that corresponds to this waste of bronze or brass in Daniel 2 okay that represents the Greek Empire we understand that there is a parallel and then in verse 7 there is he says a fourth beast and again uh, uh, 
this beast is, 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 is very strange, so we don't even know what it looks like. He just says it's dreadful and terrible. It had huge iron teeth. Now, he, what did he see in chapter 2? Iron. What did he see here? He's saying iron teeth. So there's some sort of, a again, a parallel. And iron, iron represents strength, very strong, right? And then he says it had 10 horns. Very interesting. 10 horns. Okay. In chapter 7, he begins to talk about the 10 horns. Then we pay attention to that. So, for example, um, in verse 19 of chapter 7, he says, this angel was explaining this, this vision to Daniel. He says, look, this fourth beast is a very dreadful beast, and it is very strong, very powerful, because it tramples the residue with its feet. That means it's conquering everything. So it's a very powerful empire, conquers everything that's left. And then in verse 20, he's picking up on those 10 horns. So now we pay attention to the, that detail. Right? So when the scripture is pointing us, focusing its light on some smaller detail, in this case, 10 horns, then you also pay attention to it. Now, suppose the scripture didn't have to say anything about the 10 horns. Okay, we, we don't, we don't, we'll just make an observation that, hey, the 10 horns in this beast represent uh, or correspond to the 10 toes in the image. Okay, there's similarity happening. But, what is interesting is, in chapter 7, he focuses on those 10 horns. And what does he say? This is verse 20 of chapter 7. He says, and the 10 horns. Hey, saying, Daniel, that beast that you saw in verse 7, which had 10 horns, those 10 horns mean something. What do they mean? It says, and the 10 horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up before, by which three were, before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a, and a mouth which spoke pompous words, uh, which is greater than this, he, he, he goes on to say uh, in, in verse 24, I'm skipping a few verses because he's going to tell us, the ten horns are ten kings which shall arise from this kingdom. Okay? So here's an example where in this whole Im image of the beast which has ten horns, the ten horns do mean something. So that's when we begin to look into it. And we don't go off and start making, for example, it says this beast had teeth. It doesn't tell us how many teeth it had. So we shouldn't try to, you know, make up something about the teeth. Leave the teeth alone, focus on the horns. Because the scripture is intentionally pointing to that. And he says in verse 24, that ten horns are ten kings who will arise from this kingdom. Right? So that is interesting. That means there will be ten kings. Kings in the Bible represents leaders. And you know, in, in Bible times they had kings. In today's world, we will have uh, uh, political leaders like government leaders, you know, highest ranking, which would be usually presidents or prime ministers, people in in power and authority. So we we don't have quote unquote kings as such in our day, but we do have people in places of you know government political leadership. So we can translate that. These ten horns are ten leaders, and where do they come from? Not from any part of the world. They come from, or they, what belonged to this kingdom of this beast, which corresponds to this kingdom of legs of iron. So that is why we look with interest on 
countries of today, uh, modern countries that were part of the former Roman Empire. And for the most part, these countries lie through Europe, and not exclusively, not exclusively Europe, but most part. They lie through Europe, and of course they come over to the on the other side of the Mediterranean, which is they come into Turkey and Syria, and even to the northern part of Egypt. So the Roman Empire extended over all of these places. So we look with interest on those countries because Daniel Daniel's prophecy said very clearly there will be ten leaders who will emerge from what belonged to the beast, this fourth beast or this legs of iron, which is the Roman Empire. So you look, all right, now we see certain leaders uh, from that part of the world, France and Germany who, and others. You know, now you would see Turkey, um, uh, and uh, you know what's happening in Greece and Italy and those parts. You know how are these leaders interacting uh, with each other? So ten leaders coming up. How are they all interacting? So you keep an eye on that. The other thing he said was. So I'm going back and I'm jumping back in the first part of chapter seven and the latter part of seven because first part is the vision, the latter part is the interpretation, and we're, we're connecting the two. So going back to verse 8, Daniel 7. So he, he saw ten horns coming from the fourth beast. Uh, uh, and then he says in verse 8, I saw another horn, a little one. So now we know what does horn represent. It represents a king and it represents a leader. So in verse 8 he says, I saw a little horn, meaning another leader who came but he was a little horn, meaning he was actually insignificant. So he probably comes from a, a country that uh, you know may not have may not be very renowned or very prominent. But this little horn comes, and what does he do? Before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. That means this little horn somehow may not necessarily always be through military force or political power, but he somehow gains control, influence on three of these other leaders. So we saw ten leaders coming out of that, what was the former Roman Empire. There's another little horn from some insignificant place, but he is able to influence, so influence that he's actually controlling these three of these ten leaders. Okay, just keep it in mind because in chapter eight he's going to tell us where this little horn comes from. Okay, right now in this chapter he doesn't tell us that. He just says, I saw another little horn. He takes control of these three horns. And then he says, It was this horn, that is verse eight. And, and there in this horn were the eyes like of a man. And I'm out speaking pompous words. That means he says, This little horn is the one who's, he's, he's a man, but he speaks, you know, he speaks against God. He speaks pompous, he speaks like, you know, to the heavens. So this little horn is, you know, later on he tell us this little horn is the Antichrist. Okay, let me pause here for a moment before I continue speaking a little, so, some more about this, about this little horn. Uh, are you all with me? Uh, are you? Uh, is it clear? Everybody with me? Any questions so far? Okay. Anybody left behind somewhere? Okay, I think everybody is uh, following. Okay, so in, in case in case you get lost, you know, just just tell me to 
pause or explain again, I can do it. All right, let's just move forward. So, in the same chapter, he's telling us something more about, so, this little horn. He's going to tell us more about this little horn. And he says there, uh, verse 20, I'm jumping now to the second half of the chapter because he's, that's where the interpretation is. He says in verse 20, the ten horns that came on its head and the other horn which came up, before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Ah, what does this little horn do? This little horn is going to make war against the saints. That means God's people. This little horn. Okay, something more about this little horn. This little horn is going to really persecute, really go after the people of God. Okay? Now, in this chapter, there is no indication of time frame, like when is this happening? Okay? He's just telling us this is going to happen. He doesn't tell us any time frame. What we do know from chapter 2 is that it is in the days of these when the iron mixes with clay. In the days of that happening, God will set up a kingdom. So and so we know iron mixed with clay, ten toes. So if we just keep that in, in the back of our minds, then we say, okay, so this little horn is going to come into you know into visibility and start doing his work it, somewhere during this time that means when the iron is mixed with clay sometime when god you know before god is going to set up his kingdom somewhere there other than that there is no indication of time he's only giving us information on what this little horn is going to do he's going to persecute the saints he's going to attack basically kill or you know go against God's people. Verse 22. Until, so when is this little horn going to do this? Until the ancient of days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Ah, some indication of time. When is this little horn going to do his? You know these these things that he's telling us about. He's going to speak pompous words. You know he's going to be able to take over three king uh, three of these leaders, and he's going to speak pompous words, and he's going to attack the saints. When it's going to be right around the time when God will come and set up His kingdom. Somewhere there. Oh, so it's really towards the end. Of the end times is really towards the end of the end of the age because when this little horn is doing all these things he says in verse 22 God himself will come and judge favorably for his people and he's gonna uh, 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 the saints will possess the kingdom okay so it's going to happen at somewhere at that time now, right after that, what's going to happen? The saints are going to possess the kingdom. Now, when we come into the New Testament, there's a lot more information. You know, Paul says in First Corinthians 6, you know, verse 3, he says, you know, we will, you know, the saints will rule on the earth. In Daniel 7, he's already said, in a I, I, that middle part, we will come back to it. But in Daniel 7, he tells us the saints are going to rule the, rule and reign. So this little horn is going to be doing his stuff, and then God himself will come and judge and hand over everything to the saints. Okay. 
Now, let me make a side note here. Okay, this is not the uh, this is not part of Daniel seven. It's just a side note where I want us to understand that there are two dimensions or two expressions of the kingdom of God. There is a spiritual expression and there is the physical expression. The physical expression is when God himself will come and rule physically on the earth. Christ will come and rule on the earth. And the saints will rule with him physically. That will happen in the millennium. Very clear. And we will see it when we study the book of Revelation. Very clear. And it's also mentioned here in Daniel 7. But right now, the saints are expressing the authority and the dominion of the kingdom here on earth in a spiritual way, not in a physical way. That means, are there saints on the earth? Yeah. But are the saints, you know, governing the earth? No, not in a physical sense. But we are exercising kingdom authority uh, to advance the purposes of the kingdom of God, which is take the gospel to all the nations, bring people out of darkness into God's marvelous light, and to destroy the works of the devil. That's the spiritual expression of the kingdom. Right? But there is a physical or a literal expression of the kingdom, which Daniel 7.22 is talking about, which is when Jesus sets up his kingdom here on earth, then the saints will possess the kingdom. Are we in the kingdom right now? Yes, of course. But it's a spiritual expression for a spiritual purpose, which is, you know, bring people out of darkness into light. But there's a coming physical expression of the kingdom, which is in the future. Okay, that's just a side note. And we must be very clear about it because um, in some parts of the Christian world, there is a teaching where this is mixed up. So there is so much of pressure or, or emphasis on, hey, we, the Christians, must be, you know, the people in charge of all the important places. You know, we must be the presidents and we must be the prime ministers and we must be the CEOs and <laughs> all those things. Of course, God may raise up some believers to be in those kinds of positions, but it's not like mm, we are going to do it now. That's not now. That is coming later when Christ will set up his rule and dominion on the earth. That's coming later. Right now, our work is a spiritual work. We are ushering in the kingdom into the hearts and lives of people. We're advancing the kingdom of light and pushing back the kingdom of darkness. Okay, just a side note. Let's get back to Daniel 7. So, uh, more about this little horn. Uh, over to verse 24, Daniel 7. The ten horns, are ten kings who will arise from this kingdom, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. So this little horn, like we said, he's going to, you know, gain control of three of these kings. Verse 25, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and he's giving us some more information now. Daniel 7.25, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Interesting. He's giving us some more information of, of this little horn and what this little horn will do. So he already said he's going to speak pompous words. Yeah, we know that. He's going to persecute the saints of the most time. Yeah, he already told us that. But he's telling us something more. This little horn, verse 25, will try to change times and law. Meaning he 
therefore we can say he's, he's someone who's in political power because he's going to try to control times and law like what is happening in those times what is happening in terms of ju you know uh, jurisdiction or in terms of politically what's happening with the people he's going to try to change that what exactly is going to change we will see in chapter 9 okay but he's giving us something here something more about this little horn he's yeah, he can you know therefore say yeah yeah he's he's he is a king he's a political leader and he's going to really try to maneuver and manipulate and change you know the way things are being done and even the laws that have uh, the you know the laws or you can uh, yeah you can say the laws or the things that people have agreed to he's going to try to change it and he says here in verse 25 latter part of verse 25 the saints will be given to into his hand that means he will be able to harm god's people he's going to you know do a lot of hurt uh, to the people of god for how long a time times and half a time now when you read it here you don't you know it's not very obvious but this amounts to three and a half years a time represents one year Times represents two, half a time represents half a year, so for three and a half years. Okay, now it's not very obvious here, but as we go into chapter eight, as we go into chapter nine, and even as we go into chapter 12, then we look back, this will become more clearer. Okay, for now, he says, time times half a time. I have told you it's three and a half years. Uh, it's not obvious just by reading this, but we can say that with confidence because you know of, of what what is going to come and what we will read again also in Revelation. We can say with with, with a lot of confidence he's basically talking about three and a half years. Okay, so for three and a half years, which is half of seven years of tribulation. This three and a half years is the latter part of the seven year tribulation period. It's called the Great Tribulation because this little horn is going to be able to really harm God's people. Then what will happen? Verse 26. But the court will be sated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. That means at the end of these three and a half years, we know what will happen. This Antichrist, this little horn, is going to be, his whole term will come to an end and he's going to be destroyed and cast into the lake of fire. Okay? So we've understood the image of the beast, the ten horns, and the little horn. What we still need to look into in chapter 7 is the parenthetical portion which is he has told us there are four beasts coming out of the earth but then he also has a vision into heaven and sees other things happening right so we're going to look at that from verse 9 so Daniel chapter 7 we're jumping back to verse 9 uh, let me see I heard something on the class so maybe somebody has a question say you have a question yes sir pastor um, yes. Just, just clarity, or maybe this will be explained later. But I just don't want to miss this question. That's why, um, I keep on seeing the holy people, God's people, and we're talking about tribulation, and when all this would happen, when the antichrist uh, will torment. So I, I'm just trying to understand. I know we've dealt with this, but just to clarify again, um, are we talking about God's people who would remain um, during the time of tribulation and will hold on to Christ? Or are we talking about another set of people? Because my understanding is that by tribulation, the saints would have been raptured, which mm. we, we learned in our second mm. year. Mm. So, so I see here yeah. holy people, holy people. I just need to get clarity. Are these the people yep. who will stand not to take this the mark of the beast? Is that people 
I'm done as referring to. Yeah, good question. Thanks for asking that. So in Daniel 7, the word saints is used. Now, in general, it reference to references God's people, saints. But that same word is used in two settings. One saints, and it's in the same chapter, in the same chapter. In Daniel 7, the word saints is used to refer to the saints will receive the kingdom and they will rule. So, saints. But it's also used to talk about this little horn who will persecute the saints. Same word. But, of course, it, in both cases, referring to God's people. But it's referring to different sections, I mean, different groupings. Who will the little horn, little horn, Persecute. It will be the saints, that is God's people, who are in the earth at that time, during that three and a half years of tribulation. So there will be people, like we said, both Jews and Gentiles, who will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who will be on the earth. So those are the saints. The saints, as we will see in Revelation 12, or more correctly, the elect over there. In Revelation 12, are another subset, meaning the Jews, the Jewish people. So there are two groupings of people during the tribulation whom the Antichrist is going to go after the Jewish people, as well as those who believe in Jesus Christ. We see that very clearly in Revelation 12 and 13. So those are the people who will be persecuted during the tribulation, because the Antichrist is going to go after the Jewish people, and he's going to, that is, you know, represent Revelation 12 by the woman who bore the man-child, that's Israel, but he's also going to go after everybody who refuses to receive the mark of the beast. Everybody who believes in Jesus Christ. The word saints that is used in, Revel in Daniel 7 in a broader sense, which talking about the saints who will receive the kingdom, that refers to all the people of God. Because after the battle of Armageddon, when Jesus comes to set up his kingdom, um, um, when Jesus comes to set up his kingdom, that all the saints of God, all the people of God will be here to rule and reign, which means it includes you know, Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, those who came through the tribulation, everyone, they will rule and reign here on earth. So, the same word, saints, has to be understood depending on, you know, where it is being used. I hope I explained it clear enough. Thank, thank you very good. much. That was yeah. very clear. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. Charles, question. Is this ancient of ages Jesus? So, as we will see, Charles, in here in um, Daniel 7, verse 9, the term ancient of days or the ancient of ages is referring to God the Father. And in the presence of the ancient of days is the Son of Man. The Son of Man is the eternal word, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. But when the Lord Jesus is acting on behalf of the Father, you know, so that where uh uh, you know, it says in verse 22, the ancient of days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints, the most. That means in verse 22, we know the ancient of days is God the Father, but we also know it's the Lord Jesus who's going to come and establish his kingdom here on earth. 
So Daniel 722 must be understood in that context that it is the ancient of days, God the Father, but the will, but it's actually being carried out here on earth through the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, I hope I answered your question. All right. So, Asha, go ahead. Thank you so much, Pastor. It's elaborate. Thank you. Yes, Asha. I'm sorry, Pastor. I just want a uh, uh, little bit of help. You were mentioning about the side note where the two dimensions are spiritually and physical. Where mm -hmm. the scripture will be telling about how God Himself will be coming with the saints to rule this earth. And can you please explain the spiritual one? No, that was a that was a physical part. That is Christ coming on the earth, and then the spiritual part is what you and I are doing today, right? That means um, so so there is so um, okay. Let me explain it uh, from the beginning. The kingdom of God, the expression of God's kingdom. There is a spiritual expression, there is a physical expression, right? The physical expression is the literal kingdom on earth, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ is physically present here on earth. And um, he is physically ruling and reigning on the earth, and we are physically ruling and reigning with him here on earth. And we will administer his kingdom literally. That means, you know, Asha, you may be in charge of 10 cities. You know, um, Kungbilo, you may be in charge of another number of cities. That means you have to take care of those cities. Literally, you have to do it. So that's a literal kingdom here on earth. And the saints are literally doing the work of the kingdom. But today, you and I are still part of the kingdom. We are doing the work of the kingdom, but it's in a spiritual sense, meaning we are advancing the kingdom of God, we are destroying the works of darkness, and you know we are proclaiming the gospel. How are we doing the work of the kingdom? It's a spiritual advancement of the kingdom in the hearts and lives of people, and of course that will result in uh, transformation of their lives, it will result in its impact on society, it will result in its impact on cities and other parts of the world, but not in the same way as in the literal kingdom. There, God's people will be appointed over cities. Here, we are doing a spiritual work. You can win souls without being the mayor of a city. You can win souls without being the president or the prime minister of the country. We are still advancing the kingdom. Are you understanding? Did I, make, did I help you understand that? Yes, Pastor. Thank you so much. It was well said. Okay. okay. Christopher, um, are you seeing works of the saints in the current times? Please provide examples. Yeah. So right now, uh, we are doing the work, right? So example, we are studying God's word. This is part of what saints do. Or we we speak the word, we minister the word, and our lives are being changed. So this is you know. This class example, this this exa this classroom is an example of the works of the saints. We are spreading the word of God and doing the work of God. You know, when one of us goes and prays for a sick person, we are doing the work of the saints. We are doing the work of the kingdom. Uh, you know, it, it's expressed in so many different ways. The saints are doing what God wants us to do. We are being salt and light. That's the work of the saints in the present time. Yeah. Is that okay, Christopher? I... Uh, Pastor, just uh, I guess trying to make a distinction between uh, you know the presence of the saints mm -hmm. uh, in the, you know in a supernatural sense uh, in the in in the current times and how you know what part are they playing and do we see any any sort of uh, um, I mean, are we able to discern that you know those are actually, actually can be attributed to the saints? Uh, that's where I was coming from. Yeah. Um, sorry, I kind of didn't understand that. Um, could you say that again, Christopher? I didn't understand it. Yeah. 
No, I was just I was I think earlier in the in the uh, uh, you know in this was in this uh, chapter you mentioned that uh, you know there are I mean there are scenes that are present uh, you know in in the in the earth right now and uh, they are um, they are doing their part you know to ensure that you know that um, God's purpose is uh, fulfilled or is getting fulfilled and. Uh, um, uh, obviously, you know, also the Holy Spirit is also here uh, in, in each of us also. But uh, so where I'm coming from is, um, you know, do, how, do are we able to uh, identify that, you know, some of these works could be attributed to, to, to the saints that, are, that have been, uh, that, are, that are present right now in, on the earth? Yeah, so we have to clarify. Saints, you are a saint, Christopher. Saints means God's people. You are one of them. All of us are saints. We are all saints. Yeah, so saints don't understand it in the Roman Catholic sense. You know, they use the word saints as in somebody they, you know, consider very special. But the scriptures talk about you and me as saints. So you are a saint. Every person in this classroom is a saint. So it's talking about us as saints. That's what I was referring to. I was using the word saint in a biblical sense, not in the Roman Catholic sense. So in the biblical sense, every believer is a saint. And we are doing, we are serving God. You know, we are doing the works uh, in so many ways. That's what I was talking about. All right, but, uh, thank, you for, thank you for your clarification. I think as, as you were talking, I was just suddenly realized that I probably got a bit confused with the, the, the saints and 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 angels actually that okay. are maybe playing a part in you know so oh, okay uh, yeah. i get it yeah no problem no problem okay so we have a little portion left in chapter seven uh, that is about the saints about the saints okay so what we'll do is we'll take a break come back and we'll cover that and then we go into chapter eight there's going to be more unfolding of uh, details on what you know we have seen so far right so let's go for a break come back in 10 minutes finish seven and then go into eight and maybe we can touch nine also today okay see you shortly thanks <laughs> 